OSU Extension Beef Team hosted the 2019 Ohio Beef Cattle School recently. This portion of the program is featuring Dr. Alvaro Garcia Guerra, who's going to discuss the impacts of nutrition on heifer development and conception rates of heifers. He's also going to address the impacts of nutrition on days to return to estrus and conception rates of lactating females. Dr. Guerra is an assistant professor in the OSU Animal Science Department. Okay, th thank you, John, for the introduction. Um, honored to be here, and as, as you well mentioned, I'm relatively new to the Ohio State team. Um, so um, just to go uh, dig right into it, um, John asked me to cover some of the aspects or, or the impacts of nutrition and reproduction. And um, I thought I'd try to match that on um, kind of focus a little bit of what are the challenges um, for us to rebreed that postpartum suckle cows. Um, some of the effects of the nutritional condition, and I'm gonna approach this from a very general standpoint, looking at what we know of body condition score. I think uh, Steve has covered a lot of the requirements, and what I was hoping I could show you is kind of um, some different nutritional conditions, what kind of impact we can expect on our on the reproductive performance of those um, suckle cows in the next coming season. And then at the very end, um, talk a little bit about uh, heifer development, um, where, where they should be uh, for a successful breed, and I know that's a constant challenge, and because they also contribute a significant cost uh, to develop those heifers, but we know that a better job we do on that, um, better re successful breeding we can have, and that can also have very long-term impacts on the reproductive performance of our herd. So um, usually we like to divide um, the animals or the females in our herd within different reproductive classes, and we usually compare heifers and cows, we take them separately, and we can either have them cyclic, which is where we want them to be at the beginning of the breeding season, meaning they're having estrus cycles at regular intervals, about 21 days um, between estrus uh, periods. But we know that we all have to deal with these categories down here. Uh, if you see the mouse, non-cyclic animals, in the case of cows, due to postpartum and estrus, and we'll talk more about it here in a few minutes. And in the case of heifers, is because in our current system, trying to breed animals at about 15 months of age, we know that we are very close to the time that they just um, achieved puberty. So we can run into multiple heifers that are not cycling by the time the um, breeding season starts. And what are the factors that affect whether some of the females fall within the cyclic or the non-cyclic? Well, nutrition, which is kind of the um, the objective or the main area we're looking at today, age, different, um, we know that our younger cows will have a higher, a harder time after their first calving and recovering, so there's more likely that some of them will be um, in an estrus at the beginning of the next breeding season. Calving difficulty, if, um, um, excessive um, assistance or required assistance at the time of calving can have some long-term impacts in their reproduction ability. Um, calving season, very related also to the nutrition. Uh, calving distribution is not the same if these are the first animals that calve in the, at the beginning of the calving season, they'll have a greater chance to recovery before the next breeding season. So our late calving cows will uh, tend to have more of, a, more of a challenge with that. Genetics can have an impact, and of course, overall management will also impact uh, what percentage of animals we have in each of these categories. So postpartum and estrus is a condition that occurs after parturition in which cows fail to exhibit estrus and ovulation. And this, an estrus in beef cattle, is completely normal. Uh, we cannot avoid it, but we can attempt to try to manage it or at least avoid conditions that can prolong this period. During an estrus, the follicles within the ovaries of the cows develop but cannot become mature enough to ovulate. And that's why we don't have an estrus period and we do not have ovulation. What's our challenge is that in order to maintain a 12-month calving interval, the cow needs to undergo uterine involution. So that uterus, um, after all that growth of the fetus in the last um, 60 days, just like Steve mentioned, um, will have an incredible size. And right after calving, it has to decrease that size to its previous state before it got pregnant. It, we have to resume ovarian function, meaning those follicles have to have the possibility of um, ovulating, and of course we have to actually achieve ovulation and establish a pregnancy. And in order to maintain that 12-month calving interval, 
we need to all of this needs to happen in about 80 to 85 days so we don't have really a lot of time for that to happen so the main reason uh, that people have agreed for a fail to rebreed in the subsequent season is postpartum and estrus. And we're going to see that some factors can um, make this period longer, and those are the ones that we really need to try to focus in order to improve our reproductive performance. So here is the timeline that shows from calving as day zero. And what you show here is that about 45 days it uh, takes for the uterus to completely recover from the calving process, and that's not only regression to its original size, but also some cellular changes that need to go within the uterus in order to make it receptive. That doesn't mean that we cannot get an animal pregnant sooner than that, but this is kind of what the overall uh, process um, entails. And during that period, we're gonna see that within the ovaries, there's follicles that develop and never acquire the ability to ovulate. How long it will take to that first ovulation is, considerably variable, it can be anywhere from 25 to more than 80 days and cows in the US, and a lot of that is gonna depend on um, nutrition, among other things. We know that their first ovulation is silent, come, does not come associated with an estrus period, and after that first ovulation, we have what we call the short estrus cycle, and then after their second ovulation is when we'll start having those 21-day um, cycles just as we are used to see them. So we can see that of the 80, 80 or 85 days that we have available to rebreed them, about half of that is uh, taken up by a period in which most of the animals will be in an estrus and the uterus is going to be undergoing involution. So there's some um, study from several years ago that have looked at what is the percentage of animals that are in postpartum and estrus. Focus here on, the, oh, excuse me on the postpartum cows, and we can see that on average it's slightly above 50% at the beginning of the breeding season, but that can have a wide uh, variation, anywhere from 17 to 67%. So is this variation what dictates a lot of that reproductive performance? So as you can imagine, herds that have a higher percentage of anestrous females at the start of the breeding season will have poor, uh, poorer reproductive performance than herds that have a lower percentage of animals in an estrus. And for heifers, we're not talking about postpartum an estrus, but we're talking about prepubertal heifers that not, are not cycling yet. And that percentage can have a lot of variation, again, based on nutritional programs, um, breed, and all other factors that can affect. And we'll later talk about how that can also affect reproductive performance. So during the period um, on the postpartum, um, there's a recovery of what we call the hypothalamus pituitary gonadal axis uh, that controls the reproductive cycle. And like I said, that process is normal. However, this might be delayed, which is what we're trying to avoid. Some of the factors that affect the length of that anestrous period are listed here. And what I wanna focus today is in pre and postpartum nutrition. And we're gonna measure that or looking at that through body condition score. The, most people agree that the most limited um, nutrition and challenge for beef cattle reproductive performance is available energy. And we know that the animal partition that energy and prioritize certain tax over the other. And here you have the ranking uh, that is commonly accepted for um, use of available energy. So when you have energy available, basal metabolism is going to be covered first, activity in second place, growth, and so on and so forth. And you can see that resumption of the estrous cycle and establishment of a new pregnancy is really uh, down at the bottom of the list. So if energy is a limitation, then that means one of the first things that's gonna pay, is gonna be sacrificed is that cyclicity and the ability to establish a new pregnancy. So the tool that we have to monitor the condition in our herd, and like Steve mentioned, is body condition score. Most of our U.S. Um, beef operation use a scale of one to nine, with one being emaciated or really thin, and nine being obese or over condition. And surprisingly enough, although this data is about 10 years old, um, the USDA survey indicated that the overall usage, so percentage of operations that utilize body condition score is only 14%. But you can see there's quite a variation depending on the size of the herd. And when they digged a little bit deeper, looking at the reasons why people were not using body condition score, 
Luckily, we see that it's not because people don't, don't think it works. I think everybody recognizes the value of utilizing body condition score, but probably the most prevalent cost was labor and time, and second, uh, the cost of it. So that can certainly be understandable, but we need to um, also consider that this is the one measure that we have that does not require any expensive equipment, but that allows you to monitor the nutrition condition of your herd. So people have looked at what the nutrition condition is at pre partum or at the time of calving, and what's the effect on reproductive performance. So here's some data on body condition score at the time of calving. This is, again, on a 1 to 9 scale. You can see that cows in a thinner or lower body condition score, around 3, have longer postpartum intervals. So this is the number of days from calving to their first ovulation. So when they're going to start reinitiating those extra cycle, you can see that that's almost 90 days. And I told you that in order to keep a 12-month calving interval, we need um, we only have about 80 to 85 days to rebreed that animal in order for her to calve again and keep that 12-month interval. So you can see that if they're in thin body condition score, they're not even going to start cycling by the time we should be getting them bred. As body condition score increases, we see that the interval between calving and resumption of those astrocycles gets slower. So if we can target our animals to calve between five or six on um, body condition score, then we know that we'll be able to minimize some of that postpartum anastrus. And in relation to that, here's the effect of body condition score at calving and what the percentage of pregnancy rate of those animals in the subsequent season. So you can see that Cows with thinner body condition score, or only 60% of them rebred in the following season, while cows that were body condition score of six or greater, about 92% of them um, rebred in the subsequent season. Um, what about postpartum nutrition? So um, generally it's agreed that postpartum nutrition has the potential to mitigate some of the issues that we have with uh, poor condition at calving, but it will not overcome and this is a very interesting study that looked at, if you look here on the right, body condition score at calving. And what the vertical axis here is showing you is basically the postpartum interval. So the interval between calving and their first ovulation in number of days. So we see that cows that calve in lower body condition score have a greater interval to their first ovulation. And as body condition score improves, um, then we have a shorter interval. And here on the front, you can see the effect of body condition score change after part, um, parturition. So in the first 90 days after calf. So you can see that if a cow calves in a low body condition score and is able to improve some of that condition after calving, we're able to mitigate some of that um, problem with the postpartum interval, but we cannot completely overcome it. So what that means as a take home message is that calf Body condition score at calving is always going to be more important on the timing to reinitiate estrocycles than what we can do after calving. However, if we are in a situation where we have cows that are calving in really poor body condition score, and actually that might be uh, this year if we're getting really close to it, well, then we're not going to be able to completely overcome it. But if we can provide some supplementation and improve their condition in the postpartum, we'll be able to uh, decrease some of the negative effects that we see because of the low body condition score at calving. Um, this is an interesting study where people have were looking at feeding um, low energy, which is below um, requirements for a cow, from about 110 days for, uh, prepartum, so the last 110 days of gestation. And then they combine that with different levels of energy after calving. So, LL, the first group here, means that they got low energy, about 70% of requirements prior to calving, and also low energy after calving. And then here we have a group that had low energy prior to calving and high energy after calving and all the different combinations. So if you can see here on the left, you have the extreme group that got underfed both prior and after calving. And here the HH group is the one that had um, 150%, 130% of the energy requirements, both before calving and after calving. You can see when they started, they all were in moderate body condition score of five. Here you can see some of the changes in body condition prepartum, and they followed nicely what they did with the diets. 
But what I want to focus here is first is the interval to a follicle more than eight millimeters, meaning a follicle that is starting to get big enough uh, to ovulate. You see that animals that were fed high energy um, on the pre -parum, the interval from calving to having that follicle is shorter than in animals that were fed a low energy diet on the uh, pre -cab. Um Similar thing, uh, interval to the first ovulation, you can see that prepartum diet, um, they had a shorter interval to their first ovulation. And a lot of that is related to the control of a reproductive hormone, which is luteinizing hormone, LLH. And this pulse frequency of this hormone is what governs or drives the growth of these follicles. So you can see that um, Diets with high energy prepartum increase the pulse frequency of that hormone, so that's what it explains the lower interval to the first ovulation. Um, another interesting aspect is, well, once we have cows that are calving at different uh, body condition scores, it also is gonna be important what happens with them if after that calving event, if the body condition score remains the same or decreases or increases. So this is an interesting study uh, from several years ago that shows that um, the, our best groups, even if we have cows that are thin, if they're increasing uh, body condition score after calving, we are still able to get good pregnancy rates. If they are in moderate body condition score, uh, right where we want them to be, five to six, we are able to maintain them in there, we can get good results. Interestingly enough, if we have thin cows that continue to decrease after calving, we're going to have we're going to see reduced fertility and also which i think is very interesting might not be the case this year but if you have cows that are more than five body condition score and they keep increasing that this condition and those are those really fleshy cows you might also end up paying a price on their reproductive performance and i'll show you some more information uh, of that here in a second so this is some data from last year here in ohio where we categorize we measure body condition score pre-calving, this is about 30 to 40 days prior to their due date, um, right before um, um, the breeding season, about 21 days before the beginning of a synchronization protocol. These are all fixed time AI animals. And then body condition score at the time of AI. And we categorize animals into thin body condition score, less than five, moderate, five to six, kind of where we really want them to be and what we call over conditions or those fleshy cows that are seven to eight. And you can see how um, just these are percent cycling. So uh, at the beginning of the season, meaning that they resume their estrous cycles, you can see that as body condition score improves, even in our over conditions uh, class, we can see more of them are cycling at the beginning of the breeding season. And that's regardless of whether we measure the body condition score pre-calving or uh, right before or at the breeding season. However, when we look at pregnancy rates, again, we see that for the most part, thin cows are calving, even if they're thin at the time of breeding, we pay a price in fertility. They have lower fertility than our moderate body condition score cows. But more interestingly is if you see here at the time of breeding, cows that are over conditioned or those fleshy cows, um, although they are able to resume their cycles, over-conditioned cows can cause also to have slightly lower fertility and uh, for different reasons. So in that case, it's not exactly gonna be because of a lack of cyclicity, but there might be other factors in, in animals that get over-conditioned that can impact our fertility. So take home message here then is trying to keep our herd within this moderate body condition score is what's gonna allow us to maximize our reproductive, uh, reproductive performance. Um, I wanted to share with you some um, results from a study that we did several years ago. Um, this is in Western Canada. Um, a, a large study was conducted with a collaboration of over 200 hertz, and about 33,000 uh, beef cows were followed for two years. And the idea was to look at different factors that affected reproductive performance. And the majority of these hertz are using um, bull breeding or natural service on breeding seasons that go anywhere from 45 to up to 90 days in duration. And these were all spring calving um, herds. Here's the overall percent pregnant at the end of the breeding season. And this was done with the pregnancy diagnosis in the fall. And you can see that the, the overall, on average, they're doing uh, pretty well with over 90% pregnant. 
But one data I wanted to show you here is we look at what were the factors that affected the risk of the animals being non-pregnant or open at the end of the breeding season. And the main thing we looked at was body condition score. So here you have body condition score divided into cows that were thin, less than five, or equal or greater than five, kind of where we want them to be. And when we did the body condition score at different times, where it's pre-breeding, at the time of pregnancy check, uh, pre-calving, and then what happened between calving and breeding, and between breeding and the pregnancy diagnosis. What you're seeing here is the chances of those animals to show open. So what this means here is that at pre-breeding, cows with thin body condition score were 29% more likely to be open at the end of the breeding season than cows that were in good body condition score. At the time of the prep check, um, cows in thin body condition score were two times or 100% more chances of being open than cows that had good body condition score. And you can see all these numbers indicate that cows that are in better condition are we're gonna have a better chance of getting them pregnant. But not, not only that, but we also look at the risk of abortion. So this is cows that were diagnosed pregnant um, in the fall. And if I point your attention here is cows that were thin at the time of the prep check in the fall had a 50% uh, greater chance of having an abortion after they were diagnosed pregnant compared to cows that were in good and good body conditions. So hopefully you can take from this that if we are able to maintain that uh, moderate body condition score, we're definitely going to be able to have better reproductive performance than if we have cows that are on our thin, uh, thinner side. This is some more data for bull breeding. Um, in this case, we were looking at what was the time between the beginning of the breeding season. And if you look here on the horizontal axis, day zero is the beginning of the breeding season. And when we start the season, 100% of the animals have not shown any estrus yet. And as you would expect, as the season goes by, they start coming in heat. So you can see how the percentage of animals that did not show estrus starts decreasing. And we partition cows based on body condition score. So body condition score less than four are really thin cows versus body condition score of four or greater. And you can see that um, cows that were in better condition cycle, cycle faster during the season, meaning that we have a better chance of getting them pregnant at the beginning or in the first 21 days of that breeding season. We actually were able to evaluate that too. So this is same graph, but looking at time to pregnancy. So again, day zero of the breeding season down here, if you can see the mouse, we start with 100% of the cows that are open. We put them with the bull, and you can see the cows in good body condition score, they start getting pregnant faster than cows in poor body condition score. So it's not only that they have Cows, thinner cows have less chances of getting pregnant, but they're also, if they do get pregnant, they're going to do it later in the season, okay? So um, here, I'm not going to go into a lot of details. I could talk mainly about energy, which is what we measure through body condition score. There's a lot of different components of a nutritional program that can have an impact on reproduction, and I tried to use some of the summaries that are available uh, that uh, different researchers have compiled about how excessive energy can have problems in reproduction as well. Um, um, inadequate energy intake, uh, protein, uh, some vitamin and uh, mineral deficiencies also can have um, impacts on the reproductive performance. So kind of a take home message for our, um, postpartum cows. So most of the nutritional effects of reproduction or the most common one are due to those differences in energy intake. Um, and we can monitor through body condition score the status of our herd. And like Steve very well mentioned, try to utilize the best moments on those four periods to try to recover or improve the body condition score. Some of the five basic points is prepartum nutrition is gonna have a bigger impact uh, than postpartum nutrition in the postpartum interval, so how fast those animals are gonna recycle. Um, if we don't have, if they're in low body condition score at the time of the calving, they will have impacts on reproduction even if we feed them sufficient energy during lactation. Keep in mind that when they're lactating, their energy requirements are at the highest, so it's very hard to overcome that. 
Um, body condition score more than five at Kevin ensures sufficient reserves even uh, to withstand the lactation effort. Um, if we have low body condition score animals at calving and they continue to be in low condition, that will only exacerbate the problem in, uh, the reproductive problem. And if we are in a type situation where our body condition score at calving is not really good, we know that we can mitigate part of that issue if we can um, improve their condition during the postpartum. But you have to keep in mind that that's a lot more challenging to do because of the higher energy requirements. Um, one thing to consider too is that early calving cows have, you might be a little bit more tolerant on them because you have a little bit more time to get them rebred than with your late calving cows. Remember that postpartum interval, we don't have a lot of time to get them and keep them on that 12 month calving interval. So you have, with your late calving cows, you're gonna have more problems than with your earlier cows. Fixed time AI programs are a useful technique or technology to overcome part of that anestrous problem. When we use programs that utilize progesterone treatments, we can induce some of those animals to restart their cycles. However, you need to keep in mind that the pregnancy rates to that fixed time AI program is also gonna be dependent on that body condition score, just like you showed you. So even though you have a benefit of using these programs in your thin cows, you can expect, you cannot expect to have the same results as with the cows in your good body condition score. And then here is, I took this a little bit of when to evaluate the body condition score in different stages of the production cycle and what, what can you do to adjust um, the condition. Of course, different times are gonna present different challenges, just like uh, Steve mentioned. Um, the fall is probably the best point a moment to improve the condition. Um, as we approach calving, it's gonna get harder, but we know that if we are able to improve that condition, we might be able to um, improve our reproductive performance. So then um, to finish up and going a little bit about um, heifers. So um, the big challenge with heifers is um, that because of our breeding system and trying to get them bred at 15 months of age, we're very close to the moment where they achieve puberty. So in heifers, the age of the first breeding and the conception rate is uh, primarily the primary determinant for lifetime productivity of that animal. And I'll show you a graph here. Basically, heifers that reach puberty early and bred, uh, are bred early in the breeding season will have a greater lifetime production. Um, also, there's data has shown that heifers that breed and calve early they will tend to maintain that uh, performance throughout the year. So when they cap for the second, third, or fourth time. And the pregnancy success on those heifers is um, related to the interval between puberty and breeding. And I'll show you some information uh, about I think we all can acknowledge that retaining and developing heifers uh, are part, a significant portion of the cost of the operation. So we need to make sure we are very efficient on how we develop and we select our heifers. So this is some data that actually um, has been shown for many years, but recently uh, uh, folks at the USDA in Nebraska were able to compile more recent data. And this shows that based on when that heifer calved for the very first time, if she calved in the first 22 days of the season versus if she calves after 23 days of the calving season, what percentage of those heifers are retained in the herd? So you can see that heifers that calve for the very first time in the first 22 days of the season, a greater percentage of them are retained on the herd in subsequent calving season. So I think this is uh, very important to consider and that our goal should be to try to get most of our heifers to calve as early as possible in the, in the first season. So what are the goals and the challenges that we have with our heifers? So we want them to reach puberty, or they typically do between 12 and 13 months of age. That age at which they reach puberty is influenced by genetics, and it has moderate heritability. Actually, scrotal circumference of its sire has a, an effect. So bulls with higher, greater scrotal circumference, their daughters will have uh, earlier age, um, or they reach puberty at an earlier age. We know nutrition will also affect the age of puberty, and of course the environment. And we might be in one of those years in which the environment is gonna play against us. Conception rate has been shown to be greater, so better after they show their third um, estrus, or they have three estrus cycles. 
when you compare it to heifers that have only shown one estrus or estrus period after puberty. We want them to conceive by 15 months of age, and preferably they conceive in the first 21 days of the breeding season. We want them to calve by two years of age, and this has been shown to be the most profitable um, management decision. We want them to have minimal assistance at calving, important, importance for the selection of growth, uh, birth, um, birth weight, especially on the sire, calving east sires, and we want them to have an adequate pelvic area to uh, deliver that calf. And then our challenge also is gonna to be to rebreed them as a two-year-old. By that time, we want them to be about 85 to 90% of their mature body weight. We want them to be five and a half to six at calving of body condition score. But this is gonna be challenging because if you remember for a few slides ago, we talked about how the energy gets prioritized. These animals are still gonna be growing and also they're lactating. So that means the energy requirements are gonna be high and thus reproduction is low on the list. So if you don't manage these animals properly, then we're gonna see poor reproductive performance in our two-year-old cows. So basically the definition of puberty is achieving reproductive competence. That means having estrus behavior that is a um, um, attached to an ovulation and a, a subsequent functional corpus luteum that is gonna be able to maintain a pregnancy. I mentioned to you before that there's some research that showed that if heifers conceived to their first estrus after they reach puberty, their fertility is going to be lower than if they get um, they conceive um, if they get bred to the third estrus after um, they reach puberty. So preferably, we would like our heifers to have a couple of cycles before we start the breeding season. Um, we know that winning weight will impact reproductive performance, and this shows nicely. You know, winning weight, um, this is in kilograms, but you can see that as winning weight increases, the chances of um, getting pregnant to the first insemination when their yearlings increases. This, um, this moment of uh, pre-win to achieve greater winning weights is a complex interaction of genetics, mother inability, uh, forage availability and dam milk production. And unless we're doing some type of creep feeding, we're not gonna be able to modulate uh, that weaning weight too much other than by providing proper nutrition to its mother. So what we've looked at mostly is at what we can do after weaning, how we develop those heifers. So we know that if the growth rate after weaning is higher, the age of puberty will be lower, which is kind of what we are trying to achieve. And also, that the pregnancy rates are going to be greater if heifers show estrus before or at the beginning of the breeding season, meaning that they already achieved puberty by the time we start the breeding season, and that way we can maximize the chances of them getting, the, getting pregnant. Our traditional management has been um, to feed heifers to reach a target weight prior to the breeding season. The typical is somewhere between 60 to 65 percent of the mature body weight, and here's an example for a 1,200-pound cow. At 65% of their mature, mature weight, she should be 780 pounds at the time of breeding. This, is, this should not be an average. This should be all the heifers should meet or exceed this weight that we set as a target weight. And here's some data from several years back comparing uh, the desired weight as a percentage of mature body weight with between 55% of the time of breeding or 65%. And you can see that the percentage of them that are showing heat at 20, 40, or 60 days of the breeding season increases and is greater in those heifers that are developed to a 65% of their mature body weight. And the same with their fertility. We see that um, overall at the end of a 60-day breeding season, we have higher fertility if they're developed to a 65% of their mature body weight. However, um, this strategy of de developing heifers to a 60 or 65 percent of their um, mature body weight has been questioned lately because there's been a lot of changes in the genetics and the economics. We know that the traditional heifer development system to about 65 percent of the mature body weight um, it maximizes pregnancy rates, but it's not necessarily the one that optimizes profit. And there's been a lot of research trying to understand if we can develop heifers to a lighter weight on their first breeding. Um, these traditional systems to achieve 65% of mature weight require significant use of grain in most situations and other resources that um, contribute to the cost of developing those heifers. 
Um, one of the aspects that has been looked at is at the rate of gain post-win. Does the pattern of that gain post-winning has any impact on when they reach puberty and their performance? So basically the idea would be is like, is it the same if we, um, they start growing slowly and then you have a rapid final growth period and you have compensatory weight? Or if it's better to have a constant um, growth from the time of win to the time of um, breeding. There's been several studies that show, um, and this is an example, basically, if you have a very rapid period initially after winning and then you are able to hold them off until the time of breeding, a constant pattern of gain from winning to breeding, and then a slow portion uh, after winning and then utilizing compensatory gain um, at the very end. So most studies have shown that there doesn't seem to be a difference in the age of puberty, conception rate, or calf performance uh, with the different systems. So any of these systems, as long as we attain the target weight, uh, seem to provide um, optimal or acceptable reproductive performance um, once they're bred as yearlings. Um, so what are some of the challenges with using um, a slow system at the beginning and then utilizing compensatory gain? Um, environmental conditions might not allow you to provide that fast growing uh, period as you want. So if you have really bad weather at the end of the developing period and you're not able to achieve those gains, then you might see a compromise on um, the performance. Um, if you achieve a system in which you use fast growing initially and then holding those heifers off until breeding, the challenge there is to avoid to get them um, too fat um, and that you end up going for that weight um, over. And we know that um, heifers that are too fat also can have um, reproductive um, challenges of their own. And we definitely do not want them to be losing weight or being in a declining plane of nutrition uh, during the breeding season. So some of the alternative management has been because of those changes in genetics and economics is some people have postulated that we can reduce the cost of heifer development using a target weight of 50 to 55 percent. The data that I showed you initially is from uh, 1985 and genetics have changed significantly. Uh, the use of sires with larger score of circumference um, that can result in their daughters achieving puberty at an earlier age have kind of fueled this theory that we can develop them to a lighter weight. Uh, so in this case, the system is about a 53% of the mature body weight at the time of breeding, and with the same type of cow of 1,200 pounds, that would be about 660, uh, 636 pounds at the time of breeding. Again, this is not the average. This should be the minimum target weight for those heifers. And there's been multiple studies that have looked at that, and you can see here the results. This is pregnancy rates at the end of the breeding season when heifers were developed to a 55% of the mature body weight and 64, 65 with the traditional system. So you'll probably see that in most of our, um, most of the studies, they haven't really shown a significant difference, but you can see that it's always a couple percentage larger or in favor of the traditional system. However, you have to keep in mind that that system also, our traditional system has a higher cost to develop them because we're developing at 65% of their mature body weight. So the other aspect I wanted to cover, and this would be kind of the end of it, is reproductive track score. This has been a technique that has been used now for uh, quite some time to assess the basically reproductive status of our, our heifers before they go on to breeding um, as yearlings. So this uh, scoring system, which goes from one to five, um, is associated with the pubertal status. So one are definitely pre-pubertal. They have not gone completed uh, the pubertal changes, so they're no, not gonna be cycling. And that's associated with smaller, uh, a smaller size uterus and smaller ovaries that do not have um, larger follicles or even a corpus gluteum, indicating that they have not gone through their first estrocycle cycle and their first ovulation. Um, here's some data actually from Kentucky, from uh, Dave Patterson, that shows the reproductive track, uh, track score in a significant number of animals. Um, there is some relationship to its, uh, with its weight, so heifers that are towards the heavier side, meaning they're reaching a higher percentage of their mature body weight, will tend to be placed in the higher categories. 
But interestingly enough, what I wanted to point out, it's a very good indicator of their cyclicity. So you can see that heifers on the higher reproductive tract scores, a majority of them are going to be cycling at the, at the beginning of the breeding season. And this is a relatively new study from 2014 um, out of some of the researchers in Idaho where they look at um, the reproductive tract score and what was the relationship with pregnancy rates in herds that use fixed time AI plus natural service, so one round of time AI, and then uh, they are turned out with the bull versus um, uh, operations that use only natural service. And you can see that as the reproductive tract scores increases, the success to the fixed time AI increases and you go from 40% in those uh, score one and two to over almost 65% of them pregnant after a single time AI. Similar final pregnancy rate at the end of the breeding season. So using AI plus the bull, you see that you have about 80% pregnant in the lower score system, uh, the lowest score of the scale, and you have a greater percentage of them uh, pregnant. Similarly, when you use only natural service, again, you can see that there's difference between heifers that are in the lower reproductive tract score uh, compared to those ones in the four or five point, um, four or five level of that scale. And here below, what it shows you is the median days, so the average, um, almost the average days to conception. So when they actually conceive in the breeding season. What you can see here is that heifers in the four and five category of the reproductive tract score on about 50% of them have conceived, meaning they got pregnant by 10 days after the breeding season started, compared to heifers in the lower category, which take almost 30 days for 50% of them to be uh, pregnant. And when we look at um, systems where they only use um, natural service, you can see that in the higher categories, it takes about 37 days to get 50% of them pregnant, while the ones in the lower category right at 60 days, you really reach that 50% mark. So um, target weight 55 versus 65, the condition seems to be changing and there might be values to either both of those strategies. I think it's a matter of carefully analyzing in your operation, your costs and your genetics and the environment that you have to figure out what's the best uh, scenario for your operation. Um, it's, if possible, it's interesting to sort heifers based on their winning weights for better feeding. And also, that will there's research that supports that that will reduce the cost and prevent overfeeding some of the heifers that are heavier at weaning. The pattern of gain that we use, uh, research supports the different patterns as long as the target weight is reached. Um, however, if we use a slow followed by compensatory gain, we need to make sure of uh, some of the environmental risk if we have really poor weather that prevents us to reach that target. And then reproductive trap score has been, um, it's been shown to be a useful method to select heifers prior to breeding and to partition those heifers in the ones that have a higher chance to get bred and get bred very faster in the um, breeding season. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Alvaro, we've got a couple questions for you. I think uh, at least uh, hopefully it makes a little bit of sense the way we sequenced you guys tonight. Steve kind of laid the groundwork on nutrition and you followed it up talking about some of the impacts on on uh, reproduction. And I, as Steve and I were talking while you were, were uh, explaining some of the 55 versus 65 percent heifer development rates. I think that's really a hot topic right now and I guess I'll throw out some opinion I'll let you comment on it is I would suggest to the audience to be careful uh, and pay attention where that research is coming from. I think 55% uh, in fescue country can be a bit risky. I mean I, I think uh, uh, I understand lowering costs and uh, I also think part of the impetus behind that is also to limit mature cow size. I think the thought is if you don't overdevelop them when they're little you're going to have a lighter mature cow and that is probably true but uh, developing heifers is an expensive process anyway and if we underdevelop them and we have open heifers that's not really efficient either so I, I guess I want you to comment on uh, the localization of the research and you know the sand hills of Nebraska is not exactly the fescue belt so what's your thoughts there? 
I think that's a very good point. And that uh, I think that has been a little bit of the challenge with the different research. Uh, I think there's kind of two different um, lines right now that kind of either support more one of the target weights than the other ones. I think there is no doubt that we um, developing to uh, 60 or 65 percent of the mature weight works. We know that the research is very solid on that. It's been proven for many years that you'll get a, a high percentage of them to be cycling by the beginning of the breeding season. Um, I think the approach that some of the research has taken at lowering cost is valuable, but like you very well said, it's a little bit of a riskier management. And it might be very, like you mentioned, is very dependent on the geographical area. And I'm not aware of a lot of research done on our side of the world. Most of the research, like you very well mentioned, on developing heifers to a lower mature body weight comes from the sand hills. And so I think in order to take some of those risks, we need to be careful. And likely we are in the need of some data that supports that in our current system if we wanted to push it that way. And, and to carry on that target weight concept a little bit, we talk about as yearling heifers, 55 or 65 percent, but go back to the question we had to Steve about causing calving problems. The target at two years of age is 85 percent, if I remember right, 85 percent. And so we need to recognize that that two-year-old female is still developing. I, I guess to me, Steve, you talked about uh, dividing the herd up into different groups. Groups, the group that absolutely should be divided is the first calf heifers because they're still growing, they're lactating for the first time, and then you talked about 80 to 85 days to get them to cycle back. That's a lot to ask a two-year-old. So to me, underfeeding that animal at that stage of life uh, doesn't make a lot of sense because you've got two years worth of expenses to get her to that point, and the worst thing you want to have happen is her not get bred. Yeah, and that's, that's a good, I think you brought another good point too, is that, um, you know, most recommendations would say to breed your heifers, uh, if possible, at least two or four weeks before you breed your cows, so that when they're two-year-olds, you, you're able to give them an extra three or four weeks to recover, and like you very well mentioned, their requirements are at the highest after they calve. They're still growing, and they're lactating, so that additional time will give you also a better chance of recover them before the next uh, breeding season. So that is the very reason we talk about breeding heifers one cycle before the cows as yearlings, so they get that opportunity after they eat calves as two-year-olds to stay with the rest of the herd. Um, I, I think it's uh, one question that's always a popular topic is cows, heifers, whatever, what's your recommendation for the appropriate length of the calving or breeding seasons? Oof, that's a hard one. Um, I'm so the most of the research supports that limiting the breeding season it will have a greater impact on um, weaning weights when we use a fixed weaning uh, date. So the tire we have, we have a more uniform group and they will be heavier than if you have a spread out calving season. The trade back with that is a lot of people see that if you have a really longer calving season, you might get a little, a few of them more pregnant because we are giving them more time, some of those late calvers, to um, give them time to recover. The problem is you're only prolonging that issue for your subsequent year. It'll get, keep getting longer and longer. Um, I think a 60 um, day calving season or 60 day breeding season is a very reasonable target. Um, if you are on a 90 day breeding season, you probably don't want to shift to a 60 day right away. You might want to do it gradually to keep pushing your cows back to fit in that 60 day. And, um, but I think that's, that's what we should be, we should be aiming uh, for. Um, I know a lot of people have emphasized doing even shorter breeding seasons on your heifers and that um, in some sense it make, um, it might be a good idea. One of the things I always struggle is we need to put a lot of pressure on our heifers. Um, like I showed there, um, they are the ones that are going to become the basis of our herd. So doing a um, high selection for fertility is critical. So if they're able to get four, um, 45 days, they're able to get pregnant, then they have a pretty good chance to stay around. If we are, if they're really late at getting pregnant, they might indicate that we're trying to keep a heifer that has 
maybe more problems and that wouldn't be very useful. As we wrap up this portion of the 2019 Ohio Beef Cattle School, I want to thank Dr. Guerra for his contributions to this program. I thought he had some excellent information for the audience. I also want to encourage folks to go to the OSU Extension Beef Team's website at beef.osu.edu. Uh, this slide kind of highlights some of the information that's there. Of course, many of you are familiar with the weekly Ohio Beef Cattle Letter that Stan Smith puts out. Uh, we also have uh, lots of information on beef quality assurance. We have a calendar of upcoming events and programs. Uh, we also have a very good library that has many uh, excellent resources on a wide variety of topics. And of course, this, this video, as well as many others, are located at our YouTube channel. And uh, also we have a listing of the uh, extension professionals that are part of the OSU Extension Beef Team. So again, I encourage you to check out uh, the OSU Extension Beef Team's website at beef.osu.edu.